Hey, welcome to Vortex Garage. And well, here we've got our 2003 Mercury Marauder. And the purpose of this video is a little bit of Q&A, kind of more of a long form video in response to one of the shorts that we posted. Now shorts are pretty cool. And one of them that we posted on this car is well, getting a fair amount of views. Well, at least for this channel. And I noticed uh, a lot of comments. And in the comments, there were some common questions and common things that came up. And well, there are things that you really just can't address in a one minute short. So we're gonna do a long form video today and answer a couple questions about this car and a few things about why we were doing that short and the work in the first place. Now, if you haven't seen the shorts, well, we'll post those in the comment section, but also link them up around here somewhere. And uh, well, what they were basically about was the fact that we had something wrong with this car and we were trying to figure out what it was. And well, we'll get into that today because there were some questions that came up with that. Without further ado though, we're gonna jump into some Q&A and I'm gonna read off my laptop, and make it real exciting. All right, so first question that I wanna cover is, well, this wasn't really a question, but more of a statement that came up several times in the comments. You shouldn't use anises on plugs with a trivalent coating such as the NGK TR6. And this was a real interesting one. Um, so basically, you're right. And I actually did some research based on the comments. There were some excellent comments up there. I think one of them is still pinned in the short. And essentially, yeah, NGK's website itself says you don't need anti-seize. And they actually have some things that they call out in there. So let me read uh, what they say. This is directly from NGK. NGK spark plugs feature trivalent plating. The silver or chrome colored finish on the threads is designed to provide corrosion resistance against moisture and chemicals. The coating also acts as a release agent during spark plug removal. NGK spark plugs are installed at the factory dry without lubrication or antices. Antices can act as a lubricant, altering torque values up to 20%, increasing the risk of spark plug thread breakage and or stretch of the metal shell. Thread breakage can sometimes involve removing the cylinder head for repair and metal shell stretch changes the heat rating of the spark plug and can result in serious engine damage caused by pre-ignition. Do not use anises or lubricant on NGK spark plugs. It is completely unnecessary and can be detrimental. So that's the first item out of the way there. And a little bit of backstory, um, I kind of replied to a lot of the comments. So I come from the school of thought that with these old Ford motors, uh, if you some may recall, in the late 90s and into the 2000s, uh, there were issues with some of the heads where they had spark plug blowouts, um, and those were caused by a couple things. Uh, number one, there were issues with some head designs, I think on the two valve 4.6 liters, uh, that would have a reduced number of threads. They only had a couple thread counts in the head, and that made them weaker and prone to blowout. That was rectified later on, but one of the things that would exacerbate that was normal spark plugs and the lack of anises. When you go to remove them, sometimes you would gall or even take a few threads with you as you did it. Now, if that happened, what already had minimal threads now has even less, increasing the risk of a blowout. And that was always something that came up, uh, and we'll certainly talk about this more in the video, but I've owned this car since 2005, and that's certainly something that was a big factor on a lot of the forums back in those days. And it was generally known, and of course, we were often using Motorcraft spark plugs, so you go ahead and put anises on them. Now, this only got worse as the three-valve 5.4-liter Triton came out, uh, obviously in the F-150s and the Expeditions, et cetera. And those had issues with their unique spark plug design basically binding in the head and breaking, requiring some really fancy removal tools and a lot of headaches for a lot of people. So over time, if you're a Ford owner, it sort of got drilled in your head. You didn't want to risk damage to the threads of the head or breaking spark plugs off. So you just sort of got used to using anises. So it's real interesting for me, just having that drilled in my head for so many years that it just became, I didn't give it a second thought. To then go look at NGK's website and find that detail based on the great comments, I do have to thank you. That's why I enjoy doing these videos. It's the comments and the things that I learn on YouTube that keeps us all ever just learning new information. And I think one of the only things I'll nitpick on with that is when I went to NGK's website, it wasn't readily apparent where to find that detail. And the boxes of spark plugs don't say anything on them. The ones that come with the trivalent coatings, they don't have a warning about not using anises. Um, they assume that you'll know it. And 
I'd say the biggest thing that I could see is it's such a low torque value that 20% isn't a huge amount. Um, but again, it's, it's important. And when you're dealing with older aluminum cylinder heads, you certainly don't want to gall up a thread or uh, even more so with forced induction, you know, you're changing the heat range. So I think the biggest thing that I take away from that is in a race application, 100% follow that because if you're changing the heat range on the plug, that's going to drastically impact a higher strung race engine more so than a street driven engine, um, especially one with relatively low boost and the uh, risk of anises affecting the grounding uh, and reducing the spark, which may be minuscule in terms of the overall amount, but it's still there. So in a, in a pure race application, you certainly wouldn't want to chance it. On the street and uh, next plug change, which won't be too long, because I'm going to want to pull these and give them a check since I've done the, uh, the fuel pump swap, I'll probably go ahead and follow NGK's recommendations. And uh, well, we'll see how that goes. All right, so we're going to skip ahead to uh, a, a question I had later in my sheet here because it's probably better for the video, and that is what is the history of the Marauder? And well, we'll start off with the basics. There was 11,052 Marauders produced from 2003 to 2004. Now you often see them in black, but they did come in other colors. They came in silver birch, uh, dark pearl blue, and dark Torito red. Um, so of those, the blue, the DPBs as they're called, uh, there was only like 328 of those made, and uh, I don't know how many are left at, at this day, but if you're looking for one of the most rare Marauders, it's the blue, and I think it's the blue with the white interior, white flint interior. That's, I guess, the other thing. Everyone thinks Marauder, it's black on black. That's all they made. Nope, they made those different exterior colors, and they also made a light flint colored interior. Uh, so some of those packages are a lot more rare to find, uh, but they're definitely cool cars. Now go back a little more and uh, well, the origins of the Marauder actually go back perhaps the uh, very early 2000s where Ford introduced a concept car uh, based on a Crown Vic and it had a supercharged 4.6 liter two valve engine. And that car of course was sort of the original concept. Now, based on the way Ford was going in the early 2000s, that was originally gonna be like, kind of like a high performance Crown Vic type thing and Ford was gonna get it but they really felt that Mercury needed something to help their image at the time. So they revived the Marauder name and gave that to Mercury. So the Mercury Marauder is what came from that. Now we could probably do a whole video on its own on the history of the Marauder and the history of this vehicle. But what's important to note is this is based on the Panther chassis, which underpins the Crown Vic, the Grand Marquis, and the Lincoln Town Car, as well as the Marauder. And starting in 2003, the Panther chassis got quite an uh, an overhaul uh, with hydroformed rails in the front, but it also got an aluminum subframe that added rack and pinion steering. So you've probably heard me say this on some of my town car videos, because I do have a town car as my daily driver. I always like to look at these cars from 2003 and up because you get that nice rack and pinion steering. And personally, having driven both, I think that just highway manners and overall handling is, is just a little notch up when you get that nice rack and pinion steering. The Marauder, though, is a little bit of a different beast. Now, for production models, they used a 4.6 liter 32 valve V8. It made 302 horsepower. It's basically a derivative of the Intec 32 valve V8 first seen in the Lincoln Mark 8. Uh, there's a detuned version in the Lincoln Continental, the front wheel drive version. And essentially, uh, the basic architecture of the motor, uh, specifically this motor, can be found in the Mach 1 Mustang of the, of the age. Uh, especially with the automatic transmission. If I recall, the, uh, the stick shift Mach 1s had an eight bolt crank, uh, whereas these have a six bolt crank. So we'll talk a little bit more about the engines because I want to talk about more boost, but it's just important to note that this wasn't supercharged from the factory and was built as more of a higher compression, naturally aspirated 32 valve V8. All right, so here's a good one. Only 103,000 miles and you're excited. Uh, there was a lot of variations of this uh, uh, that came up. There was some that basically said, uh, hey, 103,000, wow, that's something to be proud about. You know, my Toyota's got 300. Like I, we were talking earlier, this isn't the bulletproof two valve 4.6 liter where you would see in like a town car doing livery service with three or 400,000 miles on its original engine. But that said, I've actually seen a lot of Marauders with this engine running around with 200,000 plus miles. 
some approaching that magical 300,000 mark, no doubt. Heck, they may be out there. If you've got one, comment on the video. I'd love to see it. The reason that I get excited about 103,000 miles is something we're going to talk about as we expand on the engine, and that's the fact that this engine has lived with about 9 PSI a boost for about 80,000 miles of its life. And uh, well, it's been driven fairly hard with that boost and has not really had any issues, aside of course from the fuel pump, which is why we did the short. But what I was worried about was that the high, the nature of the motor and its high compression mixed with boost that, you know, how reliable would it be? So a little history on the car. I bought this car in 2005. Um, drove it for a while, felt that it was a little too slow, put 410 gears in the back, was still kind of slow, did a tune, all that. And then I decided really the only way to get good power out of this motor, the, the most just get it done way was to go ahead and put the blower on it. So in 2006, that's what I did with the Trilogy kit. And it's still got the stock Trilogy everything on it pretty much, except for the uh, K&N cold air intake. And I had a JLT intake for a while. But other than that, it's it's completely stock. And that was about 22,000 miles on it or something when I put it on, something like that. And we're up to 103. So like I said, we got about 80,000 miles on the engine running with boost and never any issues from the motor. Um, and that's what I'm proud about. And the reason that I'm excited about that is let's talk, go back to the 03 and 04 Cobra. Like I said, those engines are built for boost, lower compression ratio, iron block, but more importantly, forged internals. They use manly H-beam rods. They got forged pistons, forged crank. This, this car, none of that. And one of the biggest issues that you'll find on these cars as you start to add more boost and if you ever have any detonation issues is, well, a lot of people think that the rods are the weak link. And although, yes, there are plenty of cases of bent rods in these engines, there's actually a really good post from Lydio uh, from Alternative Auto. And Lydio actually uh, worked with Trilogy and did the tune that comes with the Trilogy kit. And uh, Lydio had a post back in 2005, I'll, I'll post a link to it in the comments, but he basically explained what he was seeing with some of these engines. And one of the things that was coming that caused most of the fatal engine damages was cracked pistons. And uh, the more boost you added, the more chance you'd have that, especially if you were kind of riding on the edge a little bit with the tune. And no doubt the stock Trilogy tune, it even says in the manual that there's a lot of room left in the tune. These have about uh, 390 uh, rear wheel horsepower, about 460 at the crank. Um, people have tuned, tested them stock and had up to 400 at the wheels pretty easily. People have done tunes on them and gotten quite a bit more out of that. But they kind of do state in there that when they started to kind of push the envelope a little bit, push a little more boost, push a little more timing, they just sort of lost some of that end-to-end -end overall reliability. And that's where I really found the 103,000 miles impressive, that this engine if it wasn't designed for boost, is a non-forged, all-aluminum engine, has been running with 9 PSI for 80,000 miles and many years without any issues in the motor. And All right, so here's a good one. This one came up a lot. That car is slow. <laughs> and I'm gonna agree with you there, partially. So first off, let's talk stock Marauders. Stock Marauders, unfortunately, are pretty slow. Now they compared with the uh, Impala SS of the era, the 94 to 96 Impala SS, pretty similar in terms of performance. But again, that 4.6 liter 32 valve engine had a lot more high end grunt than it did low end grunt. So when it really got out there in the world, especially when people saw a supercharged concept originally, it was a little disappointing in its straight line acceleration. And if you've seen ever the uh, literature that came with a Marauder, and I'm lucky enough to still have the original poster, it basically shows a Marauder at the drag strip smoking its tires with, uh, with, one of the, uh, with some of the old 60s Marauders in the background and some like cool looking dudes giving thumbs up. In all reality, you had to really stomp on the thing and break stand it to get it to do that burnout in the picture because it just didn't make that low end power. Now, in terms of is this car fast? Well, fast is relative. This car has run a 12.8 at 106 miles an hour in the quarter. Actually, it was like 106.9 or something like that. So it is a legit 12 second car. Probably one of the biggest holdout holdbacks that I think this car has is that transmission. It has a four speed overdrive transmission, which basically means three, three speeds in an overdrive. That translates into some long gears in certain scenarios. Now, first gear, 
off the line, this thing, you stomp it, it'll roast the tires. It takes off really, really good. Again, this thing is a legit 12 second car in the quarter mile. If you, if you punch it at the right speed, get a good downshift in the second, it'll build RPM really quickly, it'll move up. But there's a lot of places where if you just hit it, it's not gonna, you're not gonna get a downshift out of it and it's not gonna move out as quick as you'd like. Now, some of that might be the rear gearing since I have the 410s in it, but those 410s also really help with the off the line uh, in this car. So is this car fast? I think this car is fast, relatively speaking. I think this car could be a heck of a lot faster though. So I will, I will agree, this car is slow. Relatively speaking, this car is fast, but relatively speaking, this car is slow. All right, so uh, one question that came up was what supercharger is that? And also sort of tie it in with the, I didn't know those were supercharged from the factory. Uh, this is a Trilogy Motorsport supercharger kit. The core blower is an Eaton M112 design. I believe Magnuson provided the, the cases for Trilogy. It does have a unique snout on it. And then there of course is the unique uh, inlet pipe um, as well as some unique uh, uh, front accessory drive brackets and things like that that Trilogy designed. So like I said, I got this kit in 2006. I actually did a self-install on it in an unheated garage with uh, some Harbor Freight tools of the day. And uh, well, that's another testament as to why I'm impressed that it's held up so much because <laughs> a younger me with, with, uh, with Harbor Freight torque wrenches uh, from 2006 installed that thing and uh, it's been flawless since the install. So so another question that comes up that sort of is a follow-on from some of the others on the engine is, well, why don't you just put more boost to it? You're running the stock boost from the kit, put a smaller pulley, get some more boost. Now, when it came to choosing the supercharger, and we talk about modding cars, I mean, we could get into arguments with everyone about what's better, a centrifugal blower, a roots blower, a twin screw, a turbo, nitrous, going NA and boring it out. We, we all see things differently when it comes to modding cars. But I think the one thing that we can all agree on when it comes to making modifications to a car is that quite often it becomes quite the domino effect. And I watch that uh, with several folks who have these cars and they are my idols. I'll put it that way. There's a few excellent cars out there um, whose owners I consider to be friends. And I have seen them do phenomenal things with their Marauders. They're running extremely fast. They have awesome setups. But I, I recognized and learned this early on with the Marauder that adding more power to these cars does become a domino effect quite drastically at some point. All right, so let's walk through the domino effect here. So, okay, let's say we go ahead and put on a smaller pulley. So I go and order a $200 pulley, uh, go ahead and install that. Well, I can't just install the pulley. I'm gonna need to tune the engine to, under, to work with the boost. So we're gonna have to go get a dyno tune on that. And we're gonna have to make sure that dyno tune is done really well and is from someone we can trust. The next thing we're gonna need to do is make sure that we have enough fuel flow. So the more power we add, we're gonna have to make sure we don't run out of fuel. As long as we can do that in the tune, we're okay. But our tuner might tell us, hey, hey buddy, you're running out of fuel. You're gonna to need to do some upgrades. Well, now we've added a whole heck of a lot more power and we're running that through a stock 4R70W uh, transmission with over 100,000 miles on it. And well, we're probably gonna see one of those weak points in the input shaft and a few other areas. So well, we're probably gonna to wanna to go ahead and pull the transmission and have that built up as well. While we're at it, um, you know, we, we did put a lot of boost to the engine and well, if we're gonna build the transmission up, why don't we get more boost out of the thing? All right, well, if we're gonna do that, you know, we probably wanna go ahead and pull the motor Let's rebuild it and let's put some forged internals in it. All right, now that we've spent all that money, well, we might as well put more boost to it. Well, now we're maxing out that M112 Eaton. It's getting a lot of heat soak. It's running, it's being overdriven so much. Hey, let's go ahead and get a Whipple. Let's put a big Whipple uh, blower on there. Well, now we got the fuel system. We got the forged motor. We got the built transmission. We got the Whipple. Well, now if we ever hook up, we're gonna twist our drive shaft and bust our 8.8 .8 rear end. Let's go ahead and upgrade our, our rear. Let's put 31 spline differential. Go ahead and do 31 spline uh, Moser axles. Let's go ahead and do the drive shaft while we're at it. So now, we got a pretty fast car here. We've got a darn fast car, but we've put a lot of money into it. And it was a fun ride and those dominoes were awesome. But in the meantime, I just enjoy this thing for what it is. It's a very comfortable car. It's reliable. It's got a good amount of power and I can just take it out and enjoy it. And for me right now, that's exactly what I want from it. Now, if the thing was to blow up, then hey, all bets are off. 
So one more thing that came up a lot in the questions was, you know, why were you doing the compression test? If you thought something was wrong, why didn't you focus on the fuel pump first? You obviously had the data when you did the test run. So let me just explain and walk through that a little bit. There was, a, uh, there was an interesting scenario that developed that kind of pushed me down this road that I went. And it's something that when you're doing troubleshooting of an issue, a lot of times you look at all the things you see and you sort of bring it all together in your mind. And if you're like me, you start jumping the conclusions. So this car has uh, largely been in the shop when, when I can have the room for it and keep it out of the weather. But uh, last winter, I did have it out undercover. And uh, some time before that, I had noticed uh, doing an oil change. The oil in it didn't have a lot of miles on it. And one of the reasons was it just wasn't driving the car very much. So it was sitting in the weather, getting the cold, hot, cold, hot. And I changed the oil and I found some condensation in the oil. And uh, well, it kind of concerned me because you see water in the oil and you're like, what, what is this? Is this a head gasket? Is, is something wrong here? I saw that and that was sort of sticking in my mind. And my hope was it was just condensation from sitting outside. And that does happen. If you have a car that doesn't get driven enough, they, you got to drive your cars. And that's the biggest thing to learn from. You don't heat them up enough to boil off the condensation in the oil. Well, it can just add over time and you end up with it when you do the oil changes. So I saw that and again, jumped to that conclusion. Um, the next thing was, is after I did that oil change and started driving the car, I went to get it inspected. And on the drive there, it pull out onto the main road and give it a little gas and it goes into a little bit of boost. And all of a sudden the car just falls flat on its face. No sounds of pre-detonation or anything. So that kind of made me believe, well, okay, now I'm thinking, hey, I saw this condensation. Now when you get on it and you're introducing a little bit of boost, it's conking out. I'm just envisioning a blown head gasket spraying some coolant into a cylinder. And the biggest thing that we learned with these engines, especially with what Lydio posted on the cracked pistons, is pre-detonation and uh, anything like that is just a disaster for these engines. So anytime I've ever heard the slightest sound of pinging, I've always been concerned and wanted to immediately check the car out. So I, I limped the car. I got it back and I just made it up in my head as I thought about it. And I was like, you know what? It's got to be a head gasket. So I said, well, I'm going to do a leak down test. I got my leak down tester and the design of the heads is such that you, they're hard to pull the valve covers off. So it's kind of a pain to figure out where top dead center is on the cylinder. Plus, I probably needed someone to lend me a hand to basically operate the leak down test and hold the uh, crank. So my first thought was, okay, well, let me just do a compression test first, because if I've got some major damage or some other issue, the compression test will show if the engine is just healthy in that respect. It's not necessarily going to show a bad head gasket, but if something's more catastrophic, that'll let me know. So when the compression test came back fine, I started to rethink and, and come down from that worst case scenario and say, well, you know what, maybe things are fine. You know, I didn't data log it. I didn't want to drive the car because I didn't want to risk harming the motor further. But since that compression test came out okay, I said, let me take it for one more drive, hook up the laptop with Forescan and pull a bunch of data. And that's where I hooked up and saw the fuel pressure rail drop, uh, pressure drop as soon as we gave it any load. And that's when I went, okay, it's got to be the fuel pump. Um, yes, this car does have a Kenny Bell booster pump. I did test it. It seemed okay to me. Um, but I'm not convinced that it isn't failing, and that could have been what killed it. Um, I have looked up some test methods on doing those. To, again, to me, it looked fine, but I think what I'm going to do with the car is I'm going to go ahead and take it down to my local tuner, and I'm going to see if we even need to still have the booster pump in there, and I want him to take a second look and just confirm that the booster pump is operating normally, which I believe it is, but uh, I know he knows really well on that kind of stuff and can kind of give me that second opinion. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this long form video on the Marauder. We'll certainly do a lot more on this. I actually uh, did some brake work on it and took some video, we'll do that. And uh, well, anything else that we do, we'll try to capture video. I'll also maybe do another walk around video. We'll put the thing up on the lift, show you underneath. Well, check us out. We do a lot more long form stuff here on Vortex Garage. We work on things from uh, more late model stuff like this. We do basic repairs, but we also do some restoration stuff like our Spitfire. We've got the Jag in the background here. Uh, which we've got a lot of work and some videos to post on. And uh, we got our Fury out back and uh, just a lot of cool stuff, I think. And uh, we're always happy for anyone who wants to hang out and check us out. Thanks very much. And uh, well, we'll see you here on Vortex Garage.